in just a moment, we'll, uh, we'll kick things off with just a little intro to Zoom. And as we note a quorum, we'll hand it over to the judge to start the meeting. I see we have uh, someone who's called in from a phone number ending in the last four digits of 6317. Would you mind going ahead and identifying yourself? Uh, Wendell Null, Dayton, Texas. Fantastic. Welcome, Mr. Null. Thank you. We have another uh, caller. Uh, last four digits look like 5911. Would you mind identifying yourself, please? they can't hear. Okay. All right, it appears we have a sufficient number to start uh, working towards getting a quorum and the roll called. So I'm going to go ahead and just start before we open up the meeting formally. I was just going to note some of the participant engagement tools that we have with the Zoom meeting platform. So before I hand it over to the judge, I'd like to welcome everybody and just talk through some of that from a housekeeping perspective. All right. So just to let everybody know, we're using Zoom today and all of the tools of engagement are noted in the bottom panel if you're on a, a computer or laptop. We're going to be unmuting everybody en masse in just a moment when it's time for roll call. And we ask that when we do that, that you all be mindful and please mute yourselves when you're not speaking uh, and please turn off your videos if you're not engaging um, or presenting it today in the meeting. Um, the mute and start and stop video controls are in the bottom left hand of your panel. And if you'd like to send us a question or comment through the chat, that chat button is in the bottom center portion of the panel. <clears throat> if you'd like to raise your hand and, and be noted for a comment uh, in the middle of perhaps a, oh, pardon me, give me one moment. We have one of our presenters who may be having a challenge. Please excuse me before we get started. Jill, you, Jill, yes, sir, Judge. You, you may want to also note the, uh, we need to mute our phones or put them on vibrate anyway. Sorry. Yes, sir, one moment. Mine just went off. <laughs> We have a uh, phone number calling in with the last four digits, 5911. If you could go ahead and identify yourself. This is Amy Young. Thank you very much. If anyone else is joining us by phone today, if you could unmute and identify yourself. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for your patience. And uh, to Judge's point, we would like to remind folks that uh, please mute your phones or put your 
computer notifications down so that uh, we don't overhear some of that as well. And uh, so the, if you'd like to raise your hand during a presentation or during a portion of the agenda items, you can get there via pushing the participants button and then pushing raise your hand, which will be in the lower left hand of a pop-up window. For the iPhone controls, the mute and unmute are noted here with these red circles in the bottom left hand of that panel view. To get to the chat function, you have to push the three dots that say more and then click chat. And again, that will be sent to everyone in the group. So we'll be able to note that. Wendy and Sarah will help me keep an eye on that to make sure that we get to all of your questions and that they're noted as well. And then if you'd like to raise your hand, again, it's the participants button on, on the iPhone view. It's the second from the right. And you would push raise your hand in the pop-up window there. So with that, I believe, Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, from our participants view, it looks like we have a quorum. And uh, Judge, it's ready when you are to go ahead and start the meeting. Okay, let's call our meeting to order. This is a little bit different for all of us. Uh, most of us probably have been on some Zoom meetings in the last uh, seven, eight, nine months. But uh, welcome remarks. I'm just glad we're all here in one form or the other. Roll call. Let's start. I'm going to call them if I mispronounce your name. Uh, it's not my fault. I'm going to apologize ahead of time. Gary Bassinger. Here. Dad Burke. Here. Dane Carlson. Dane Carlson. Here. Here. Michael Ferdinand. Here. Mark uh, Nick Finan. Nick. Diana Grove. Diana Grove. Carlos Guzman. Jimmy Henry. Here. John Isom, John Isom, Mayor Guy Robert Jackson, Frank Jordan, Garrett McLeod, Marlon Mitchell, Wendell Null, here, Josh Owens. Yes, sir, Judge, here. I think you look good with that new goatee. <laughs> well, I hope my wife can hear that. Over her <laughs> <laughs> I shaved the beard. <laughs> All right. Charles Rogers. Mike Roselle is here. Jessica Russell. Daniel Shiner. Here. And Glad you're here <laughs> that you're presenting. BJ Simon. Yes, good morning, Judge. How are you? Good. Yeah. Gwen Tillotson. Andrew Van Chow. Good morning, Judge. Here. Looking forward to a great session. Morning, Andrew. Mike Walker. Mike Walker. Brandon Willis. I'm here. Annie Yang. Here. Good morning, Annie. How are you? Fine. How are you? Good morning. Good. Vince Yoakum. Mostly here. Mostly here. <laughs> well, that's good, Vince. All right. That's our board that are here. Maybe if we see anyone come in, uh, Jillian, you can get those get those signed up as far as being present. Will do. Public comment. Anyone from the public here to speak? Anyone from the public? Okay, let's move to action item number four. Approved minutes of July the 10th, 2020 GCEDD board meeting. I'm assuming everyone's had a uh, time to read that. Do I have a motion to approve? So move, Judge. Make motion, this is Gary Basinger. Okay. And second, second. By, was that Guy Andrew? Jackson. Guy Jackson, mayor. All right, any discussion? Okay, those in favor, uh, say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. What I'll do, I think, uh, on our next one, we only have two, but I'll just ask for those opposed. If, if there's none, we'll, uh, if we can agree that it is approved. Action item number five, approved financial reports. 
in the yes. district? Is there yeah, a you should all have received the, a copy of the most recent district financial report, which hasn't been substantially updated since the July report. Um, and we also have Isaac Perez with our um, revolving loan fund available as well if you have any questions as far as the district and RLF financial reports. Go ahead, Judge. Okay. Or any, uh, any uh, let's get a motion first. So I hear a motion to approve. You do, Judge Josh Owens. I motion to approve the financial reports. Judge Jackson, Jackson, second. Okay. Discussion, questions regarding our financial reports? Okay. I hear none. Then uh, those opposed to the financial reports say aye. Okay. The motion passes. Item number six. We're going to, go to our first presentation. Is Ryan here? Guerrero? Oh, um, pardon me, Judge. We actually have one more um, item to cover, and um, we had a, oh, yes, a notice come in. I apologize for that, but I've heard from um, Member Yoakum that he has been interested in filling an existing vacancy in the executive committee that was left over from the last meeting. So I thought uh, I would drop that in here and um, invite anybody who who supports this idea to uh, make a recommendation or a motion on his nomination. Thank you for bringing, I'm reading, not looking at my screen. Apologies. Judge, I'd like to go ahead and uh, nominate Vince Yoakum for that uh, position on the executive board. I believe that's the treasurer role, is that is that right? Finance? Yes, Correct. Correct. This is Gary Basinger and I second. Uh, okay, Vince made a second. Uh, those opposed, say aye. Okay, then uh, Vince, congratulations. Thank you, Judge. Looking forward Thank to you. serving. And I appreciate you stepping up. Um, item number seven is we're on the on the first presentation, Danielle. Uh, yes, uh, we're, we'll come back to the uh, the items and and some announcements there at the end of the meeting. But uh, we have our first presenter, Ryan Guerra. Ryan, have you joined us? I have. Thank you, Julie. Perfect. So feel free to share your screen when you're ready. I also have a backup if you need it. Yes. Uh, can you stop sharing, please? Mm hmm Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody, for having me here today, uh, judges, governors, et cetera. I uh, very much appreciate your time. Uh, my goal here today is okay. to share a little bit more about uh, what Skylark Wireless is doing in your counties <laughs> to help bridge the broadband gap and uh, let you know a little bit more about federal programs that are coming your way and will almost certainly affect your counties as well uh, going forward. Um, just a look, uh, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Ryan Gare. I'm the founder and CEO of Skylark Wireless. Um, we are a spin out of Rice University. Uh, myself and my co-founder are Rice University electrical engineer PhDs. And uh, we got started back in 2011, building uh, a new technology, the first of its kind in the world called Massive MIMO. It's a new kind of 5G base station. Uh, I got a picture here of one of those systems with hundreds of radios on it. Really complicated, a lot of blinking lights. It was a very exciting project to work on. And we felt that that was gonna be the future of what wireless looked like. Um, turns out we were pretty much in line with what that's gonna look like. And uh, we spent the last uh, eight or so years um, iterating on that platform, getting out into the field through pilots, and uh, are now commercializing that technology to bring broadband uh, to everybody that doesn't have it. Um, so I'll share a little bit more about uh, uh, what we're doing and um, you know, get through this relatively quickly to open up for questions. Um, so as most of you probably know from your constituents, and, and this has definitely been emphasized by the COVID-19 pandemic, um, a lot of folks that live in rural areas don't have access to uh, true high-speed affordable broadband. Um, it's about 40% of Americans in rural areas, according to the FCC. Uh, that's about 16 million households. And if you could provide broadband, not only is it good business for internet service providers, but it's good social policy. Uh, you connect all of these people to all of the benefits, um, education, entertainment, uh, health now in particular, uh, that broadband access, affordable and uh, ubiquitous, um, can afford them. Uh, one of the main reasons for this is that to connect people that live in rural areas, it costs too much, whether it's a high cost satellite, 
um, fiber to the home or wireless networks, they either cost much too much to be a viable business, um, preventing investment in infrastructure, or they can't provide the uh, performance that is required to provide broadband. And that is again reflected in the cost of the network. So uh, overall the UNESCO and the FCC um, estimate that it costs about five times more to build rural broadband networks to connect uh, say fiber between farms, et cetera. Um, and then when you do that, you earn less revenue from fewer people and they tend to be lower income than some of the more dense city locations. And as a result, you have this underinvestment in rural infrastructure. So at Skylark, uh, we, we actually said, um, you know, we think we now have the technology to solve this problem. Um, to, and I'll talk a little bit about how we're impacting the cost of these networks. Um, just very briefly, I'm gonna touch on what our 5G technology looks like. Um, we focus on technology called massive MIMO beamforming. Our system is called Pharos. Pharos means lighthouse in Greek. And it talks about how our system actually searches for users with the beam. Um, so if you look at what uh, of traditional 4G wireless systems and most of the modern uh, new 5G systems do, when they provide connectivity, they broadcast energy in a sector. That's your picture there on the left, if I wanna talk to somebody. Um, what Massive MIMO does is it actually uses an array of radios at the base station to focus the beam at the intended user. Basically, I can go further with higher signal strength and more reliability um, and less interference to the rest of the network. And actually, because I'm causing less interference, I can do some smart math at the base station and form multiple beams to multiple users on the same channel and at the same time, giving me a multiplier in capacity. So at the end of the day, I can serve more users at longer range and more reliably therefore bringing down the entire cost of serving those users. Um, to give you an idea of what that cost looks like, um, we looked at data from uh, federal broadband subsidy programs and um, submissions over the past two years, 2019, 2020. This encompasses all technologies. These are primarily fiber to the home deployments and um, that's uh, 240 so projects uh, all around the US, only in rural areas. And if you look at the average cost of these programs, it's about $7,100 per household um, just to pass them, not even to provide service, just to get fiber close enough that when they demand it, you can go out and send a team to install service. Um, our application to this program submitted early this year in April um, does that with fixed wireless at around $400 per household. And that's probably around six to 800 to send a team out to go install equipment and actually bring them service. Uh, once we've reached that point. Um, and that's a huge difference. That, that's an enormous difference. And that makes all, all the difference for companies uh, being willing to go out and put up the capital to build out these networks and provide that service. Um, this is what our project looks like. Uh, we're actually focused in the Houston, uh, Austin, San Antonio area. We're right there in the middle. Um, our, prog our project proposes to cover, provide service to the blue region shown in this map. Um, we'll pass about 22,000 households. Based on our projections, we think we'll have maybe around six to 7,000 subscribers uh, to service. And that whole project will cost us about $10 million to build out the towers, the infrastructure, and install equipment in the, the users' homes to actually serve them. Um, that's pending review. A lot of the delays have been pushed back and back because of COVID-19. Um, ideally, we would break ground on January 1st on this project. Uh, but again, we're pending review. So if, if you represent one of these areas, let the USDA know that you'd like broadband, please. Um, our systems, this is what they look like. This is one of our pilot systems. Uh, this one's actually on a water tower out in Giddings, Texas. Um, uh, so this is one of our, our operational prototypes. It's a 64 radio system um, serving a 120 degree sector and providing service uh, 10 to 15 kilometers from that water tower. Um, so it's a really nice picture of, of what our stuff looks like out in the field. Um, these are the subscriber installations. Uh, you have a little box on the side of a user's home or up on a pole if they're really far away. Um, that little box is connected to an antenna pointed at the base station. And then you have ethernet running to the home where you can put a Wi-Fi hotspot, uh, a voice line, uh, and yeah, provide broadband to the user's home and anything inside of it. Um, so we have a couple out there installed for this pilot uh, to develop and prove that the technology does work at long range and in real environments. And we've had that up there since uh, mid last year. 
Um, to just give you an idea of kind of the, the performance, this is maybe a little bit of information. I, I put in the slide deck so you could go back and refer to it. Um, these blocks here show wireless radio spectrum that is uh, relatively ideal for rural broadband. Basically, this is wireless spectrum that is available for broadband ISPs um, and is low cost compared to other alternatives of purchasing wireless spectrum. What I wanted to point out here is that um, as you go in frequency from left to right on this chart, um, you have a block of, of spectrum that provides very long distance, about 32 kilometers, 32 to uh, 20 kilometers range, um, uh, th which is ideal for rural areas. You just don't necessarily have a lot of it in many locations. As you go to the mid band right there in the middle with the orange and yellow colors, this is new wireless spectrum that actually just went on auction and was sold um, last month and then will go on auction in December. And it's hundreds of megahertz of great spectrum for rural operators. It's relatively co low cost. And we think that this is gonna be a boon for a lot of rural operators that wanna deploy new networks. Um, so thank you for the FCC for going through this 10 year process to clear that spectrum, then auction it off uh, and get it into public use. And then finally, at the very high end, a lot of the Wi-Fi technologies that we, we know of to serve our home or you know, very short range networks are at high frequency and they don't go as far. Um, and the other thing that I wanna point out here is that a lot of the 5G systems, uh, in particular Verizon's in the, in the center of uh, uh, the city of Houston, um, rely on what's called a millimeter wave technology. So very high frequency, very short range. If you hit a, uh, an obstruction, a tree, a building, you can't get through it. Um, and so that might be a really good solution for a dense city of Houston, but it doesn't work the moment you hit the suburbs and then go out beyond that. Um, and, and that's why you're gonna see most of the rural broadband operators focus on the left-hand side of this chart. I wanna provide a little bit of technical information just to uh, give you an idea of, of what rural operators are thinking about. Uh, the next big federal program that you guys are gonna see um, that is I think heavily gonna influence your, your areas is the FCC's Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. Um, there's information on the slide, I'm not gonna read through it. Uh, you can look at that afterwards. But essentially, the FCC is going to inject $20 billion in rural broadband subsidies to build out new infrastructure and new systems. And it's specifically focused on rural areas where there is no current broadband um, today. So $16 billion is going to be auctioned off starting at the end of this month. And then they're going to follow up spending the rest of the money in another $4 billion um, early next year. We'll see what the timeline looks like for that. Um, these locations, uh, you're basically gonna have a service build out over the next uh, three to five years, uh, starting at 40% coverage uh, all the way to 100% coverage of the regions that are where these subsidies are being provided. And um, we'll see how this plays out, but in our estimates, a lot of these locations will go to service providers that are promising to provide 50, 50 megabit downlink to the home, uh, maybe even 100 uh, megabits per second service, which is on par with some of the fixed uh, fiber to the home services. Um, so th that's what we're hoping on. That's what we're planning on. Um, I, we're really eager to see how this auction turns out and we'll know in mid-November. Okay, I know my time is short. I wanted to point out this Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. Um, these red regions on this map are, are the regions that are eligible for these subsidies. Uh, so you're gonna see a lot of activity of companies focusing on proposing projects that, um, that cover these regions. Uh, our, our USDA reconnect project that is pending is that, that black outlined region and the blue areas inside. So you can see the scale is much larger than what we're doing. Um, and uh, if I zoom in a little bit, this is the last picture I wanted to share with you. Uh, these red regions covering the Houston Galveston area um, are the regions that are, have these RDOF subsidies available. Um, I can send you more high resolution pictures if you're interested in seeing how this looks. Uh, at the end of the day, um, our ask from you guys is if you know uh, service providers or other partners, municipal or otherwise, that are interested in owning, operating high-speed broadband networks in starting in 2021, um, they should reach out to us. Uh, we're, we're looking at doing the turnkey network design installation and handing off the operation to somebody who wants to operate these broadband networks. And uh, we'd love to start talking to folks that are interested in making that happen. Uh, specifically targeted towards these these red regions. With that, I'm going to uh, wrap up the presentation. Thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. 
Uh, Ryan, this is Vince Chokum. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Are you interested in work? We have been working with our local um, electric co-op to piggyback their <clears throat> poles and wires. Is that someone you'd be interested in speaking with? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the electric co-ops are ideal partners because they have infrastructure and you can build right on top of it, bringing down the total cost of that project significantly. So their, their main objection so far has been that they aren't experts in the industry and don't have the expertise to provide the technical support and the back end and so forth. Is that something y'all would provide? They would just simply provide the infrastructure and y'all would take care of any technical support, et cetera? Uh, yes. So, so um, there are two ways to handle that. One is uh, we pro provide, say, tier three support for the equipment. Uh, we're also working with partners right now that can handle the retail side of the operation. So tier one, tier two support. You know, who picks up the phone when a customer calls and says, my, my service is out? And right. my understanding, that's probably the thing that they're looking to, uh, for a solution. And it, I know this is sort of a radio thing, but is it, is it considered point to point? Uh, we're actually point to multi-point. So okay. you can go anywhere within our network coverage. Uh, you can even walk around, drive a tractor. We've had our radios on drones and it'll track you uh, wherever you go. What about interference with trees and things of that nature? I mean, do, do trees cause a problem? It depends on the, the spectrum. So if you're at the, uh, we actually, our systems work uh, on the entire radio spectrum. There are software defined radios, some technical details, but they operate on all of that radio spectrum that I showed you in that plot. And if you're on the left-hand side, very low, low frequency, uh, you propagate very well through trees. If you're on the high side, um, then you're going to have trouble with a lot of foliage. And what you do is every particular site, you, you decide what is ideal for that location and your budget. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm def I don't want to take up more of your time, but I'm going to definitely follow up with you on this. Okay. Let me ask a question. This is Mike Rosell. Uh, who would make a, uh, a partner? What, what type of company or people would make a partner? Yeah. So um, uh, uh, Vince already mentioned that the electric co-ops, um, if they're interested in, in building out service to their customers or, or new customers, um, that, that would be an excellent partner, again, because of the existing infrastructure that you can build off of. Um, there's also should be a number of different internet service providers uh, probably already operating in, in these rural uh, areas and districts that are per perhaps not providing broadband speeds today. They're probably relying on Wi-Fi or whatever they can cobble together. Um, and what we're trying to offer them is a more structured, higher performance carrier grade infrastructure that can provide that 50 megabit, 100 megabit service reliably. Um, and, uh, you know, I think those would be ideal customers. They know the problem, they know how to, how to sell the, the service and, and provide, you know, support, uh, but they don't have the technology uh, to do that. Okay. Do you have any idea, Ryan, how the Gulf Coast Economic Development District can help you uh, achieve all these things? Uh, so right now, uh, frankly, our biggest thing is to line up uh, customers in as many areas as possible. Um, I can't share details. Uh, this is from the FCC. Uh, I can't share details about our bidding strategy, where we're bidding, how we're bidding um, on these rural subsidies. All I can tell you is that we are involved <laughs> very heavily. Um, and what we're looking for is um, partners that we can work with that can be the retail face. They know the communities that they're providing the service to, um, which means they best know how to market and get it into their hands as quickly as possible. Um, that's something that will allow us to scale this much faster than if we had to do it from scratch ourselves. Okay. So I think maybe the answer is providing that connection. Um, you, know, you, you know the folks, you know the problem areas in your regions. Uh, if you can connect us to the operators or potential operators in that area, um, that would go very far. The second is our, our program is pending with our, our loan application is pending with the USDA. We'd like to, we'd like it to move along. It's been delayed because of COVID-19. And um, if we're going to break ground in January, we've got to start planning now. Okay. So basically finding out, putting people, our people in our areas in contact with you, with your company. Uh, absolutely. And so my contact information is here on this slide and uh, please feel free to reach out. Even if you just have questions, I, we're happy to answer. Other questions? Yes, Ryan, I had a chance to speak with you earlier about Warren County and our broadband needs here. Unfortunately, your blue dots don't line up with our red ones. <laughs> would we 
would it be possible for us to go seek this broadband funding from the USDA, the reconnect program and have you, uh, you know, be the, the technology or how, how could, how could we get, how did we turn our red dot into a blue one is I guess my question. Gotcha. Um, so uh, I, again, I'm, I'm going to dance a little bit around this issue just because of the uh, non-disclosure things that I have with the, the FCC until the auction is over. I can't talk too much about our strategy. Um, our goal is to essentially make that connection so that um, the, the window for applying for the subsidy has passed. Um, that was in July uh, to pre-qualify to bid in this October auction. Um, so if you're not already pre-qualified, you're not going to be able to participate. Um, our consortium is pre-authorized to bid in nine states, uh, Texas primarily one of them. Um, and I can assure you that we will be aggressively doing that. Um, and so what I'm looking for is essentially um, by the end of December, we'll kn the auction will be over. We'll know which regions. Uh, everybody has won. Um, and actually, if you just want to contact me and say, look, who, who won in this region? Can you just give me a short list? Was it you? Was it somebody else? Who should I follow up with? Uh, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, unfortunately, we didn't have our, our ducks lined up in a row to bid in this auction or participate, really. I'm thinking more, mm -hmm. is there any opportunities with the USDA's reconnect program? Because we have large tracts of, of rural, would that be worth us investigating? Yeah, so the, the USDA, the, the second round on the USDA did close, uh, the application closes closed in April, and they're only starting to get around to issuing approvals or, or um, rejections now. Um, they, they just sent out a notice uh, two days ago that they're opening up another round. Um, it's not as strict. Uh, if you contact me after this, I'll follow up. I'll send you a link um, to that, that third round. Uh, keep in mind that you, you will have to be a ISP um, or have uh, company audits uh, to participate um, in that program. But in, in, I'll, I can forward that information. Thank you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? Okay. We have one question in the chat from Diana Grove that says, have you been in contact with the San Bernard Electric Co-op? San Bernard. No, I have not. Okay. Definitely. Certainly appreciate it. It's worth uh, discussing if there's something there. Ryan, are your slides, uh, I believe I already know this, but your slides will be available to uh, to us. Will you send those? Yes, I, I received them from him already. And uh, you all should have been able to have a look at those yesterday. Let me know um, how that came through. Uh, but I had everybody's slides who are presenting today distributed. And uh, they will also be posted right after this meeting online. OK, great, great, OK. All righty. Any, any other questions? If there aren't, aren't any, thank you very much, Ryan. This has been very uh, informative. It's also a very important uh, system we need to address and see what we can do to help in our areas. Thank you for your time, everybody. Okay. Let's go to item number. Are we on item number seven now, Jillian? Yes, sir. Um, the next speaker that we have lined up is Danielle. Okay. Danielle Shiner with the Conroe EEC. She's our executive director. Danielle, are you there? And are you ready to share your screen? I am. Let's see. Can everyone see this now? Looks good. I All right. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, again, my name is Danielle Shiner. I'm the executive director of the Conroe Economic Development Council. I appreciate uh, being asked to present this project. It's, it's somewhat timely in the world we're living in right now with COVID-19, which is, I think, the reason that, that we were asked to present today. But i um, very excited for the opportunity, really excited about this project for a number of reasons. And so with that, I'm going to jump right in. Um, let's see make it advance here, there we go. So just a couple of quick slides on the front end just to kind of describe who we are. Um, obviously the city of Conroe is on the north side of Houston, about eight miles north of the Woodlands, about 40 miles north of downtown Houston. 
We um, I have a total population of about 91,000. That was based on the numbers that came out in July. Our population growth between 2010 and 2019 was almost 40%, um, which made us the ninth fastest growing city in the United States. We've kind of hovered in that top 15% for about 10 years now, um, you know, kind of alternating back and forth in size. Um, our median age continues to get younger. We're at 33 currently. And our um, overall, uh, the educational capacity of our community is continuing to increase. We're now at about 33% that at least have an associate's degree or higher. And we've got within the city limits, a labor force of about 43,000, but within one, um, a 30 mile radius or drive time of our community that obviously being in the Houston region, we've got over a million. This is kind of a map of the area and we'll talk about a few things on here quickly. Um, I'll, I'll point out if you can see my mouse here, this is our industrial park, Conroe Park North. The project that we're going to talk about is actually in this park right here, the Dyson Technology Park. And then this is the airport, Conroe North Houston Regional Airport that does have a US Customs facility and um, a 7,500 foot runway, which is just about 10 feet shorter than Hobby's main runway. Um, our central business district, downtown Conroe, is located here, and I'm in this little building here where the red dot is. Um, and then another big development that I want to point out is the Grand Central Park, which is um, a Johnson development community. This is the old Camp Strake for those of you that were Boy Scouts and may have spent your days camping here. Um, this is being developed as a big uh, mixed use development. This area in here is single family residential. This area up here is kind of your typical power center type of retail and commercial. And then um, a project, you know, here that I'm going to talk about in just a minute is um, uh, we're working on a, a hotel and conference center project that the city is involved in. And then, of course, Sam Houston State University has located a medical school campus here in Conroe. And this is a picture of the building. Um, life sciences are, are one of the uh, target areas that were identified in our strategic plan that we did. And, and um, this is sort of represented in this first project uh, that Sam Houston took out and on Grand Central Park in that location. So this, uh, this campus, it's a five story, 216,000 square foot building. It's on 7.3 acres in Grand Central Park. And 75 students started uh, their first year of classes this fall um, in that campus building. So we're really excited. This uh, school is uh, a college of osteopathic medicine. So the graduates of this program will be receiving a DO um, as opposed to an MD. So some of the other major life science employers in Conroe currently are um, obviously our, our hospital here, which is affiliated with the HCA system. And um, that hospital is our largest employer and it's a regional tertiary uh, referral center. So it's designated as a level two trauma center. Um, there's two level two trauma centers in Montgomery County and they're the only ones on the north side of Houston until you get all the way to Dallas. Um, there's a certified primary stroke center there, um, accredited chest pain center, and uh, it's also designated as a level three neonatal AC ICU. Cantel Medical is um, uh, one of our major employers in our industrial park. It's the largest employer in our park. They have uh, well over 600 employees now and they're spread out over three or four buildings. Um, they are the leading provider of infection uh, prevention products and services. And so they've got several product lines and packaging lines that are located here. Um, McKesson has a pharmaceutical distribution facility here in Conroe that serves uh, this region. And then uh, Stericycle, we actually have a, a biohazardous medical waste disposal facility here in Conroe, which is not something that, you know, you typically talk about much in presentations about your community, but uh, suffice it to say that a lot of the um, medical waste that is produced in, in the med center and in the Houston region actually gets disposed of here. And I won't go into the process because it's, it's if anyone is, is just finishing up breakfast, it's not exactly the, the most uh, uh, appetizing thing to discuss. So our newest um, life science employer will be VGXI Inc. Um, and this project was announced and we'll get into the timeline here in just a minute. But 
Um, a little bit about the company first. They were founded in 1997. They're an industry leader in developing DNA vaccines for deadly viruses. Um, they, they had vaccines for Zika, for Ebola, and for MERS. Um, they're a wholly owned manufacturing subsidiary of Gene One Life Science Inc., which is um, headquartered in um, South Korea. And they're the largest uh, pure play CGMP DNA plasma manufacturing facility in the world. They're currently located in the Woodlands, Texas. This is actually their location um, currently in the Woodlands. And um, they recently did an expansion project there in that facility. I guess it's been maybe a year, year and a half ago. Um, and they're already to the point where they need um, an additional expansion to increase their capacity by 500%. And they're just simply out of room in the facility that they're in currently. So uh, this is a quote from their CEO, Young Park. Um, and the, the piece that I wanted to highlight is, you know, basically they established the site to build a brand new facility that they would own because they're currently in lease space. And then it would give them kind of a multi-phase expansion um, strategy to allow them to continue to grow as the demand for those uh, plasmid products for um, immunotherapy and vaccine therapies and gene therapies um, will continue to grow. So the project kind of started, this is sort of the timeline of the project with kind of the key things that happened. Um, we were first consulted or contacted by the consultant in late May of 2018. <clears throat> we worked on a response to that proposal um, that was submitted early June. And then we had our first site visit for the project in January of 2019. Um, we Obviously, there, there's a lot of time span and a lot of back and forth between that bullet point and the next bullet point, which is when the incentive agreement, uh, our initial incentive agreement was approved um, with City Council on November of 19. And then the tax abatement was approved in January of this year. And then we did a subsequent tenant improvement grant that was approved in March. Um, and then after that was complete, we closed on the land or they closed on the land in August and uh, same day did their news release about the project, which is probably where most of you saw it because it, it was picked up by HBJ and some of the other local uh, news publications. Um, the location for their new facility will be in Dyson Technology Park. And if you recall on the map, I sort of pointed out where, where that is. It's, it's nestled in between our airport and our industrial park. Um, this park, where our industrial park was really designed for manufacturing distribution types of operations. This park was specifically designed to be um, office R&D. You know, it's got a campus-like feel. It's, it's a very different um, type of park. And so it's 248 acres. It's got hike and bike trails throughout and water features. It's actually become a pretty popular park locally with residents that come out there and use those um, facilities. It has a concrete, all the streets are concrete. Um, all the signage, this is the picture here is of our entry pylon sign. You can see it's got a real modern feel. Um, at night, it's lit up in different colors. Um, it's in a beautiful kind of wooded campus-like setting. All of the infrastructure is in place throughout the park. Um, it's got city water and sewer, um, electric provided by Entergy Texas, natural gas by Centerpoint Energy, and then um, fiber by Consolidated Communications. And then it's protected by covenants and restrictions. Conroe is not unlike other communities in the Houston region in that it, it does not have a zoning program. So both of our parks have um, covenants and restrictions to kind of uh, guide the development and, and the types of things that we want to see out there. So this is kind of a Google Earth view of the park and you can kind of see the infrastructure here. This road is called FM 1484. Um, so it's a major farm to market road. This road here is Technology uh, Parkway and it actually connects, you can see it in this area, this is an older Google Earth image, but you can see this road actually connects it goes uh, on this end directly to our airport and on this end through our industrial park and crosses I-45 and it actually dead ends into Lake Conroe. Um, the company purchased this 21.671 um, acre tract here. Uh, and then they also have a right of first refusal on an additional 21.52 acres here for their um, expansion plans. 
So their initial phase will be a 240,000 square foot facility. They plan to employ um, 70 and, well, they currently employ 70. They plan to expand to 150 with this expansion um, in three to five years once they've completed um, the first phase. Their capital investment is around 80 million um, and then their annual payroll will be about 10 million a year. Um, they are anticipated, they've actually already broke ground. We haven't done a formal groundbreaking. It got, it was supposed to have been this month or actually in September and they've, uh, they've rescheduled it for November 8th. Um, but the, the uh, substantial completion is to be complete um, third quarter of next year. And then they plan to be fully operational in January of 2022. So if you, let me scroll back here. So this center section here is what this picture is of. So it'll kind of give you a feel. So they'll basically be on this side of the park because this is taken from the north looking south. And then this part over here would be their, their future expansion uh, opportunity. And this is a rendering of, of what the building is intended to look like. This will be um, sort of the the back side of the building, and then this is the front portico entrance coming in with the driveway. So they have um, a, their building partner is BE&K out of uh, Birmingham, Alabama, and they'll be the ones that will be constructing the project. And um, in April, they actually announced completion of the manufacturing and release of a DNA vaccine um, to combat COVID-19, which is currently in clinical trials and they have a partner with Inovio. And some of you may have seen some of that um, correspondence as well. They actually wound up in a lawsuit with Inovio. They were to be producing the vaccine for Inovio. They, um, Inovio wanted them to provide their um, proprietary information. They took them to court. Um, the court actually ruled in BGXI's favor. And so I think Inovio is ultimately um, appealing that to um, the Supreme Court there in um, Pennsylvania, but we'll see, we'll see how that ultimately resolves. But uh, BGXI won the first phase of that battle, so um, we'll see where things go. They, they have um, contract manufacturing currently in Germany to keep up with the um, demand that's been produced for, this, for these plasmids. Um, that's the reason they want to build this facility basically is to be able to bring all that contract manufacturing back in house um, and be able to do it here locally. And so they, they have to use um, kind of fermenting tanks. And right now the largest one they have is 500 liters and the, the ones that they will be putting into the facility will actually be um, 1500 liters. Um, so those, it's gonna, you know, Obviously, as I mentioned previously, 500% increase in their capacity and, and with the growth and expansion space that they have, they can certainly do much more than that. Um, so with that, I think that's, I tried to keep it brief since I knew we had multiple presenters today, but um, I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Any questions? Looks like uh, Conroe's trying to be Northeastern or something. <laughs> you guys are, uh, I had, I know they were growing, but uh, man, that first slide was very impressive. Y'all need to be proud of that. I, I will say just anecdotally, I moved to this area from the Austin area in uh, 1999. And I think when I first moved here, Conroe had about 35,000 people. Um, and so it looked very different than it does now. <laughs> I can yeah. assure you, I've lived with a lot of the growth over the last 20 years. Right, right. Well, we hear every day people that don't want to, they don't want change. Well, I guess we all would like to stay how we're comfortable with, but uh, if we're not growing, then I think that we're, we're going backwards. So congratulations. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. If there's no more questions, uh, what's our next presenter? Yeah. You're on uh, Larry McManus, is that correct? Yes, sir. And I just want to thank the first two presenters. I thought they were both um, not just timely, but they've been working on projects that have extended well before this current era that we're in. But I think the thing that's really um, been interesting to hear about their projects and the opportunities that they've been able to leverage is the amount of salience and urgency that both of these um, companies and organizations have been able to sort of leverage this time. And that it's a signal of things that are to come. And, 
things that I think the region can start to think about strategically as far as what future opportunities there will be in different parts of the market. Um, and without further ado, I will introduce um, our next speaker, Larry McManus. He's um, with the, of the Office of the Governor in the Economic Development and Tourism Department. And uh, he, many of you will know him from his work in rural development and are familiar with the name, but he's been part of a lot of really important work that's been going on at the state level. Um, with the strike force uh, post COVID uh, <coughs> supply chain changes that have been happening uh, due to trade and, and the ongoing uh, shifts across manufacturing and trade and logistics of the last few months as well. So again, um, Larry, have at it. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you to the first presenters as well. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Hopefully you can hear me. Mm -hmm. All right, great. And thank you, uh, Judge Rosell, for the opportunity to visit with the Economic Development District. Also want to note, um, I, we have Betty Russo on uh, as well. She's uh, our East Texas Gulf Coast Regional Representative. I know most of you uh, know her and have visited with her. She's the eyes and the ears of the governor out in your area. So please uh, reach out to her if, if you need uh, assistance and uh, a lot of what I'm talking about here, uh, Betty is familiar with and knows about uh, the programs and knows about what's going on in the office. Uh, my goal today is to kind of give you an update of what's going on in economic development and tourism and talk about uh, what our activities have been, kind of where, where, where we stand from an economic development standpoint, um, COVID-19 and the governor's response and uh, hopefully where we go uh, from there. Uh, but initially, I'd like to start about um, our, our, our agency. Oh, December of last year, Adriana Cruz came on as the new executive director. And a lot of you had, uh, had interacted with Adriana over the years. Um, she was um, working at the local level for a number of years. She was in Governor uh, Perry's administration early on. Uh, when economic development um, got moved into the governor's office. I was a part of that as well. Um, and uh, she was named the executive director back in December. And in March, um, Nicole Riff uh, had uh, decided to uh, leave the agency and move to uh, another state. And uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, be brought back to the governor's office. I had been over at the Texas Department of Agriculture for a couple of years overseeing the rural economic development activities. And prior to that, I had been in the governor's office for about 14 years. So I, uh, I've been with the state of Texas a little more than 25 years, all of it in economic development in some form or fashion, and I'm glad to be back. Uh, it's been an interesting experience. Uh, about a week into coming back into the office, we immediately started to telework. So uh, I teleworked uh, through, uh, I guess the end of June, in July, we, we started coming back, the directors started coming back into the office. And um, uh, probably at the end of July, uh, beginning of June, we started bringing in staff at different uh, levels. We're about 33% in the office for economic development and tourism. If you've visited our office, um, the governor's office actually ha physically has uh, three buildings that they use. Of course, the Capitol has the governor and a lot of the functions there, but on the Capitol grounds, there is a state insurance building that's at the corner of 11th and San Jacinto, which is across from the La Quinta uh, that's there. And then there's an insurance annex, which is, just south of the Capitol grounds across street, uh, 11th Street, that's where we're located. We're uh, at the top floor of that building. And um, if you visited, you, we, we have a, a, uh, a pod set up, uh, not an not a individual cube set up in, in our workplace. So uh, it's a little difficult for us to, to make sure that we're uh, meeting social distancing standards. So for, from our standpoint, the rest of the governor's office is in at 50% and we are, uh, we are in a, a situation where we're one person per pod uh, in our office. So we're, we're looking to, 
to restructure that. Um, so if you visited our office, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but the team has been rotating through uh, and have been working both teleworking and uh, in the office. I have physically been in every day uh, since we were asked to start coming back in. Um, the, the Economic Development and Tourism Office, if you're not familiar with uh, our activities, um, and um, when Adriana came on board, she wanted to make some changes. And one of the things that she did do was she separated the Economic Development Finance uh, Group and the Economic Development Bank, which is housed there, into its own entity. And it used to be a part of business and community development, but she felt that it made more sense and would, would be more efficient being its own uh, entity. So I'm the director of the business and community development section. We do have a new director for the economic development finance section. His name is Terry Zrubek. And Terry actually was that uh, at one time. So uh, Adriana basically put Terry back into that particular position. We feel that uh, the office will flow better that way. Uh, we do work closely from a business and community development standpoint with our economic development finance group. They, hand, they, they handle the incentives and programs within the office, and I'll talk a little bit about that, that are focused on economic development and business development activities. We do have four other divisions within the office. Um, we do have a Texas Workforce Investment Council. They work closely with uh, the different workforce agencies, uh, education agencies, um, and the Higher Education Coordinating Board to ensure that the workforce is um, skilled and that the programs that um, the governor and the legislature are looking at um, benefit the state as a whole. So they are involved in the long range planning and strategic planning of the state's workforce. The Texas Music Office, they obviously work with uh, the music scene here in the state of Texas. Uh, we do have a travel uh, group. Uh, a lot of you uh, have participated and know that they've been around for a while. Hotel, motel, sales tax dollars cover those uh, individuals. And then we have a uh, film commission, which um, promotes uh, filming and video uh, production here in the state of Texas. And there's some incentives there uh, for those areas. Today, I'm going to focus my discussion primarily on the business and community development activities. Um, I will touch on our economic development finance group and some of the programs there, and then we'll um, uh, probably touch a little bit uh, on the other areas within economic development as it has been affected by COVID. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll move on from there. Of course, our, our office, uh, what, what we're, uh, designed to do is to promote the state of Texas uh, as a premier uh, business location and tourist destination. Our role, our goal is to, um, uh, oops, going too far, sorry. Uh, our goal is to try to help uh, communities with their, um, in growing their economies and um, assisting uh, those particular communities and assisting businesses in helping um, expand and, and grow these economies across the state of Texas. Of course, uh, you may or may not know there's more than 1,200 communities in the state of Texas, uh, 254 counties, all of them responsible for their own economic development activities and, uh, and growth. Of course, we do have some communities that don't wanna grow um, and we have some that do wanna grow. So we work with all of them and try to whatever way we can. One of the ways we do that is in my group here, the business and community development uh, team. And our functions uh, are separated into these uh, areas that, that are highlighted. Um, and actually it might make sense to go to my next slide, which kind of shows you our team members within each of these areas. We have a business recruitment team. Some of you may recognize the names on here. Uh, Ted Curtis, Annie Calandruccio, uh, we have a, some new members, Ashley Lundy and Arnie Jacob, who have joined the team, and Michelle Rueda, who is our intake. This is the team that works projects that are uh, looking for sites. Uh, do, we do some site search activity for businesses, 
and uh, work with you at the community level when you're working with uh, potential uh, relocations and expansions uh, from businesses who are interested in the state of Texas. The, you know, we don't see all projects um, across the state. We do uh, act as a entryway for some projects. Site consultants and businesses will contact us and we'll reach out to our community partners through our site selection activity or individually, depending on what the company wants. Uh, we take our direction from the company, um, so we don't, we don't direct them uh, to where they need to be. They tell us their interest and we will work with them to uh, facilitate information. We also work with you at the local level um, and our regional partners. You all will get contacted by businesses and consultants as well. And when you contact us, we'll work with you directly. Um, we'll let you know whether contacted by the company or another community um, so that you're aware um, that we're working not only with you but with with another community but if it is just you we will slowly work and uh, and ensure that uh, your information is confidential and we're only working with your community uh, we one of the things that Adriana wanted to do uh, that is a little different than previous administrations is create a business retention and expansion group. We had a we have a industry team that is very proficient and uh, specialized in uh, specific industries and we've asked them to become existing business industry specialists. So if there is an existing Texas business that you are working with, you will probably work with either Joe Magruder or Phil Rocha. Uh, moving forward. Um, we feel that it's important to uh, have this particular function to ensure that we're providing the most efficient service from our office and making sure that we're touching um, uh, as many projects as possible to provide the information that you, you need to try to help these companies in expanding in your particular area. We do have an international group. Uh, they do work with international projects. Uh, they do uh, tend to, well, they will uh, involve the business recruitment team or the existing business team. Uh, they are our specialists on the international front. Uh, they host delegations. They do have expertise in trade uh, and export activities. Uh, Shirley Temple and James Chen, um, they are our uh, international team. Uh, we, you know, we're kind of, since uh, since Adriana has come on board and since I've come on board uh, in March, we've kind of made some changes to the to the team and the structure. Uh, we're looking to try to add to our team. Um, we feel that uh, there's a lot more business and a lot more activity in the uh, staff that we have on board. So hopefully uh, we're able to uh, kind of make some additional uh, activity or, or maybe uh, add some team members in, in certain areas that uh, that will make it more beneficial for the community uh, partners across the state. But just so that you know, we're, we're, we're constantly, constantly looking at our workload and uh, wanting to be as efficient as possible and making sure that we're effective for you as a community and as a regional body um, at the state level. We do have a marketing team. Uh, they do work with in support of our business recruitment and uh, expansion activities and international activities. Uh, they do also work with the nonprofit arm of the, of the governor's uh, activities, which is the Texas Economic Development Corporation. That's a nonprofit. They are strictly uh, around to market the state of Texas. Um, they help develop uh, leads that our office will work. And, and um, they're headed up by Robert Allen. Uh, some of you may know him or some of you may be members of the Texas Economic Development Corporation. Our marketing team works uh, in conjunction with them. One of the things that Adriana is uh, looking to do is have a more unified uh, approach towards marketing and working closely with the Texas Economic Development Corporation. Um, their slogan is go big in Texas and um, they do have a website uh, uh, businessintexas.com and you can uh, see the marketing activities that, uh, that they are participating in. Of course, the pandemic has curtailed a lot of that at the moment, but once we get 
to a point where we're back traveling and uh, marketing, um, I think you'll see uh, our office and the Texas Economic Development Corporation working hand in hand uh, on marketing activities and marketing the state of Texas um, uh, to businesses and to uh, entities um, that are interested in expanding here in the state. Uh, we do have a research group that helps support uh, our activities as well. And then um, we have a small business team. And during this pandemic, they have actually been the most active uh, within the office. In my 25 years working at the state level, um, this pandemic has hit the small business uh, environment uh, the hardest and has um, you know, had the small business team work in overtime. Uh, we've had to pivot a lot like the businesses that have been affected by the pandemic uh, to address um, our assistance and technical assistance. Uh, they've been working with, uh, with uh, uh, different partners throughout the state, small business development centers, uh, our federal partners at the SBA, uh, US Department of Commerce. And um, we, we have a program where we would do in-person small business events and we had to pivot to uh, small business webinars. So some of you may have seen those uh, happening uh, on Wednesdays uh, over the last six, seven months. Early on in the pandemic, we were having them uh, pretty regularly once a week. Uh, once the pandemic uh, kind of, uh, or once everybody kind of got used to what was going on and the information was being provided, we had, uh, we had individuals talking about the federal assistance that's available, uh, talking about small business, uh, development center uh, activity and uh, subject matter experts to help these small businesses. Um, we've gone to about twi twice a month uh, now webinars and we will continue that uh, until November. So we've had about 13, I guess 12 or 13 webinars, uh, had a great uh, response uh, about, I don't know, 12,000, 11,000 uh, attendees uh, over that time frame, um, or so registrants, I guess, over that time frame. Uh, so it's been very, very popular. A lot of people eager for that type of information, and we're trying to do our best to assist small businesses as much as possible. And then I talked about Betty being your regional uh, representative. Um, she covers uh, the East Texas area uh, from the Gulf Coast north to the uh, Arkansas and Oklahoma borders uh, east of I-35 uh, or, you know, go, you know, the Houston area, deep east Texas, uh, northeast Texas, and uh, she's a great um, contact for you all. We do have four other regional reps um, uh, throughout the state. And then uh, lastly, Michael Traeger, uh, he's uh, our strategic planning and operations uh, officer here within the office, within the business and community uh, development team. Uh, overview of, of how our business development activities are set up. I talked a bit about our economic development finance group. They, they house several incentive programs that the state has. Uh, of course, the most uh, prominent one and the, the one that tends to get a lot of publicity is the Texas Enterprise Fund, uh, which is used as a deal closing fund. Um, it is a deal closer where we have competition with another state. Um, uh, the project needs to be down to one community before it can be used. Uh, there are some wage requirements meeting county average wage or above. Uh, there are other uh, specific requirements to that program, but we work closely with our economic development finance team uh, to help uh, assist businesses who are expanding and or um, looking to expand into the state of Texas. Of course, we have the Enterprise Zone Program. That's a sales tax rebate program uh, back to um, businesses. Communities can nominate projects for that. Uh, we have a loan program, Product Development and Small Business Incubator Fund uh, for businesses who are looking to expand uh, product or work, um, work to uh, expand its ac activities. Um, we have an events trust fund, which has actually been uh, used uh, most recently uh, for a lot of different activities. Um, it's a sales tax rebate to a community that puts on an event uh, uh, and it, 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 uh, it 
it, 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 it's not uh, money is coming out of general revenue. It's basically money is coming from the event and the revenues coming uh, being generated from that. And so it helps incentivize uh, in an event um, to happen here in the state of Texas. Uh, we have a spaceport trust fund uh, that um, currently works with the spaceports across the state. I think there's one in the Gulf Coast area that's eligible for that. Capital access program is a uh, is a loan program. Unfortunately, we're we're tapped out on on that particular program. It would have been good to be used uh, during this pandemic and the small business um, uh, area. Uh, I don't know whether in the next legislative session um, this will be a program that they look at to potentially help fund activities. Um, but we can kind of talk about that a little bit here um, after the end of the presentation. Um, also within the finance group, uh, we have a, a Governor's University Research Initiative. I know that Rice University and uh, you, uh, the University of Texas system has accessed this particular program primarily uh, for research and uh, help funding research and in individuals that uh, are, are specifically um, targeted to be a part of the university's uh, staff and be able to help provide funds to reimburse the university um, for gaining those individuals on, the, on staff and working towards uh, specific research. So a lot of companies are picking Texas. Um, you know, why Texas? We got all, all kinds of different uh, reasons for that. Um, here you can see you know, we're the ninth largest economy in the world. If we were our own country, um, you know, some people would say it's 10th because if California were its own country, but we're assuming California won't be its own country and we will be our own country there. Um, you know, our, our workforce is 14 million people. That's a lot of people uh, that uh, companies are interested in. You know, our Texas Workforce Commission does a very good job of trying to put monies out and, um, bring uh, skills up, up to speed um, so that uh, these companies um, are interested in that labor, labor force. Um, so it's all kind of come to where we've been able to um, uh, be, be noted for, for our business climate. As you can see, these uh, awards and accolades uh, show that. Um, uh, the, your, uh, our, my presentation is, I think, in your packet, so I won't go through these things, but you can kind of get the, the gist of that. Um, you know, I don't know if you know this, but we have about, we have 50 uh, Fortune 500 corporate headquarters here in the state of Texas. The Gulf Coast Houston area has, uh, has probably the most of those, um, but this is a list of those that, that helps in the whole scheme of things. Our location, our infrastructure, our airports, our seaports, um, all play uh, a, a role in uh, in interest for these companies, and these companies look at these things and, and are are taking a look at that. Uh, probably the number one thing right now is uh, labor and the skill labor, uh, but but our infrastructure does play a vital role in that. And of course, internationally, um, we've been ranked uh, number one 18 straight years for. Uh, trade exports, um, specifically coming out of that uh, uh, Port of Houston. Um, the areas that we target um, from a state standpoint, um, back in, oh, 90, or in 05, uh, 2005, the state did an industry cluster initiative and um, came up with six clusters, uh, advanced manufacturing, aerospace aviation and defense, biotech, life sciences, information technology, petroleum refinery, and uh, chemical products and energy. Those are still uh, targets that the state as a whole uh, pursue. The reason uh, they're targeted, it's kind of how, how, what points do you give for some of our programs or for uh, the incentives that are available for the company? And that's kind of what, what they look at. They look at, is it part of a target industry? Um, that type of thing. Well. Um, within each of those, there's specific, um, excuse me, specific areas such as advanced manufacturing. You know, you have the food, automotive, semiconductor sector. One of the things that we've added also is corporate operations. Um, so we actively try to uh, uh, work towards these particular areas in 
um, in our activities, whether we're working with our marketing initiatives, our marketing efforts with the Texas Economic Development Corporation, or um, if the governor is making uh, uh, cold calls, <laughs> and the governor has been doing that lately, um, there have been a lot of uh, there's been a lot of interest from businesses uh, looking at the state of Texas and how the state of Texas has uh, gone back to business and how they've been able to uh, move forward in comparison to the states that they're in. And so uh, we've been fortunate to, to receive a lot of uh, inquiries and phone calls on that. Um, so what's the economic impact that we've had, um, especially since um, COVID um, uh, over the last um, oh, six months or so? Um, this particular slide here talks about the economic outlook. Of course, this was back in July, so it kind of shows you a 10-year change. Um, and, and we've been we've been fortunate to to be positive in that 10-year time frame, uh, even during July when at the end of July when COVID was uh, uh, relatively new in 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 the economic space. Um, but you know. What these what these numbers show is that we're still active. We're still working projects. Um, uh, in August, um, there were still 23 new projects announced in the state of Texas. One of the things that we do as a state agency, and um, our research team keeps track of, is how many uh, projects have uh, announced here in the state of Texas. There is a competition. Um, there is a competition um, with one of the industry magazines called Site Selection Magazine um, that uh, uh, gives a governor's cup. And so <laughs> the state uh, works with our community partners to ensure that we've identified uh, projects. And we've been very fortunate over the last 10 years to, to win several of those uh, uh, governor's cups. And a lot of that has to do with you at the local level. Uh, it also has to do with your legislative uh, bodies and uh, the leadership at the state of Texas uh, providing that pro-business climate and making sure that it's an environment where businesses can succeed. And, um, and, it, and it's uh, represented with these numbers. Um, most recently, the biggest project that we did in August was uh, uh, a BAE systems project, 700 jobs. And then actually the, the, the month before, we had a, a Tesla project that wound up locating in the Austin area. Um, so fiscal year 2020, our fiscal year is between September and August. And um, what this shows you is our active projects um, in, since that time frame. And uh, it, what's, I guess, interesting is that uh, we had our COVID orders in March and you can see that uh, all of a sudden we had a lot of inquiries <laughs> and a lot of activity happening. Um, and it, it goes down to how the governor has been able to manage the, the COVID response and uh, how to keep the state open with the regula regulation environment that we have. And other businesses noting that and having frustration in their particular areas. So um, it's, been, it's been interesting, um, you know, Here's a breakout of those particular projects uh, based on uh, industry cluster uh, that, 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 we've, uh, that we're tracking. Uh, most of them are manufacturing. Uh, manufacturing, we've broken out a little bit here. Uh, general manufacturing, you're showing about 25%. But if we, we look up here, you know, advanced technology, manufacturing, aerospace aviation, and automobile manufacturing all kind of add to that. Um, as well, and and so you can kind of see that we're pretty diversified within each of the industry clusters. Uh, of course, manufacturing has been the biggest uh, uh, activity for prospects, and then food and agriculture kind of comes second. But for the most part, we're pretty diversified across the state, and that's part of the reason that that those industry clusters um, are what the state. Uh, targets and with our marketing initiatives and with incentive initiatives. Um, okay, so during the, the COVID uh, pandemic timeframe from March up until August, uh, these, these sets of slides will kind of give you some, 
some trends to, to see. This is unemployment trends. I think we're at about 6%, a little over 6% here uh, at this point. It was as high as 13 or so uh, during the time frame. But because the economy has continued to be open, um, it's, it's uh, uh, lowered that particular trend. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, when we were having an issue with essential businesses uh, being, uh, being only the ones opened, about 70% of our manufacturing businesses were deemed essential. So we had about 70% that were um, continuing to, to move forward. Eventually, the governor opened that up. Uh, we do have some restrictions on, 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 or the governor does have restrictions on a number of uh, percentage of uh, employees back in office settings and so forth. Um, but the, the governor um, has been able to open, it up, open up the uh, economy uh, through, a method, <laughs> through a methodical, and strategic approach. Um, keep making sure that it's uh, based on science and the medical doctors that are advising him and making sure that, the, that it's safe for not only uh, employer, employees, but also customers um, as the economy uh, uh, grows. So 6.8% uh, unemployment as of August. Of course, here's the manufacturing outlook. You can see that sharp uh, spike downward and then back up. Um, that was when everything closed um, in March. And then this is the service sector outlook. Now that one hasn't been as positive as the um, manufacturing. This is manufacturing and this is service sector. Um, but the, the economy, as you can see, has gotten back up uh, from those spikes downward. And then uh, retail, uh, similar, similar um, issue for retail. Uh, it seems to be spiking uh, at different levels. Travel industry has been hit hard. Um, you know, our, our tourism department has had to pivot itself, uh, has had to uh, work uh, with our tourism and convention and visitors bureaus on um, issues, trying to be virtual, trying to provide uh, services um, for individuals, what they're seeing mostly is in-state travel now as opposed to out-of-state travel. But, um, you know, over time, uh, that, that seems increasing, um, as you can see from June through August. So um, I know from a personal standpoint, my wife and I, we haven't traveled uh, too much other than outside our area. Uh, coming up on an ever anniversary and we're actually going to travel more than three hours away <laughs> from where we live so that uh, and we're going to be spending a night in a hotel room so that'll actually be the first time we do that so um and here's the uh, hotel performance as you can see it's just you know it, it dropped all the way down in in april and slowly slowly coming back uh so um you know it's 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 hard to it's hard to um to figure where this will go at, at the moment. It's gonna take a while before these numbers come back. Um, this is uh, TSA uh, checkpoints. I know that the airlines uh, have been having issues themselves. So we'll, it's, again, it's still a wait and see, where do we go from here type of, of scenario, scenario for the travel industry. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll just kind of have to uh, play it uh, by ear and see how it goes. Um, the, com the comptroller, you know, he, he's come up with a, an estimate for the next legislative session, um, expecting a potential deficit of four and a half billion dollars uh, for the next biennium. Um, so in response, the governor has issued or requested state agencies to lower their budgets 5%. Um, whether or not that needs to be added or not, that uh, we don't know yet. Don't know what the legislative session will look like. Don't know uh, yet um, how things will, will move. Um, only recently have we been given the ability to have in-person meetings with state agency partners. We still cannot do in-person meetings with the public or uh, individual businesses or our community partners. So everything we do is still virtual. The um, state agency partner thing is primarily getting ready for the legislature. Um, and that by this time in a regular 
year there would be committee meetings or be meetings happening but um, that's been that hasn't been the case at the moment so I think those are still being worked out um, regarding the the initial response to COVID-19 the governor created a supply train strike force which was very um, very beneficial to the state um, it, it, we saw a lot of small businesses and companies manufacturers pivot uh, to to create PPE equipment um, and uh, the the strike chain I mean the supply chain strike force uh, reached out to those companies helped build a supply for the hospitals across the state uh, and successfully closed out their mission um, at the end of June if I'm not mistaken uh, and um, now the Texas Department of Emergency Management is actually managing any supply chain activities. And if businesses are interested in providing a, uh, to the state, they would work through the Department of Emergency Management. They will probably have to sign up uh, through the state's um, uh, comptroller's business uh, uh, data uh, or the business supply network. Uh, I can't remember what the, what the entity is called, but um, they would have to sign up with the state in order to sell to the state um, for that purpose. Uh, and then, you know, the, the governor allowed uh, for restaurants to sell bulk products, the delivery of alcoholic beverages with food, um, allowed trucks um, from the alcohol industry to deliver grocery supplies and so forth. And some of these may actually uh, continue moving forward. It's it, uh, you know, these some things had, have changed the way we've done business. Um, some things have changed the way that the state has uh, has worked with business at the local levels. Um, so some of these things may wind up staying. Uh, our small again, I talked about our small business team. Uh, they wound up uh, uh, putting uh, a huge effort towards information and and providing uh, assistance to our small throughout the state. And if you go to our website, which is um, gov.texas.gov slash business, uh, you can sign up for our e-newsletter updates and uh, our most recent frequently asked questions in small business, which will include anything that is uh, having to do with COVID-19. Uh, so um, be aware that that's out there. And then the other programs that I talked about, our events trust fund and our enterprise zone program and our product development, uh, small business incubator fund, they also uh, uh, pivoted and, and made it a little bit easier or tried to encompass the environment, the teleworking environment we were in due to the pandemic, um, ensuring that uh, we were uh, business friendly and community friendly in our programs. Uh, same with our enterprise fund program. As a matter of fact, uh, because businesses are teleworking now, um, the office has uh, made a, a proactive effort to contact our recipients and to kind of do a proactive amendment for our our contracts, um, especially where job creation is in, is uh, uh, specific to site location and allowing for teleworking to be account to be accounted for specifically for this year, possibly for future years. So we've been proactive in that. Uh, arena and we had a meeting with a site selector the other day who said that uh, they were impressed that the state was proactive in that uh, realm and uh, that all the other states that they have interacted with were still trying to figure out what they were going to do because they have those type of um, requirements in their contracts so um, we have we've been able to be proactive on our end of course um, music industry live events um, you know, the bars um, have been affected uh, heavily and, and our, progr our programs are trying to assist those in those industries as well. Talked about and so forth. So the governor, he, he created a uh, strike force to open the state of Texas. Uh, you can find all the um, uh, checklists that businesses uh, need to ensure that they're open accordingly and that they have, uh, and the customers also uh, go to those um, checklists to make sure that they're, they're, they're safe as well when they're visiting those businesses. And they are updated based on the most recent um, announcements. The, uh, you know, the governor had phase one, phase two, phase three, uh, different parts of phase three, uh, 
going and most recently going from 50% to 75% capacity in certain areas um, within the um, uh, capacity of, of businesses and um, being able to uh, open up the state. And so the governor, you know, he, he's done it um, methodically, uh, scientifically. He has uh, doctors on his strike force team. Adriana Cruz is part of that uh, uh, strike force. Um, there's different areas within the strike force. Uh, one is medical, one is economic development, one is education, one is federal. And so there, uh, there are subject matter experts that are participating in each of those areas. And uh, Adriana has, uh, is, is uh, uh, working in that particular area. So that, that, that's a quick overview. <laughs> and I say quick, that took about 45 minutes. That's a quick overview of what, uh, what's going on in our office uh, from an economic development um, standpoint. Uh, I know that we work closely with a lot of community partners out there. Hopefully you've seen some of the changes, some of the activity. Um, uh, hopefully you've seen a lot more activity from our office. Um, uh, and I, I, you know, I, I'd be happy to take any questions uh, that, that you all may have at, at, that, at this point. Okay. Any questions from, uh, from the board? I have a couple I'll start with. Great. Uh, the uh, how how are you how are you your organization business community development at the office of the governor? Where does that fit in with the TDED Texas Department of Economic Development? Is that just a so so um, the Texas Department of Economic Development was abolished back in um, two thousand three, and it was moved into the governor's office. So economic development and tourism is actually the uh, skeletal structure, I guess, of the Texas Department of Economic Development. And we, we do work with our partners, the Texas Economic Development Council, which a lot of your economic development uh, or your, a lot of your economic developers are uh, members of. We work with our nonprofit, the Texas Economic Development Corporation, which is our marketing initiative. And then we work with all the communities across the state um, and our regional partners. Okay. Uh, you know Judge Mosley? <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Uh, do you know Do you know the judge? Yeah, good friend, good friend. <laughs> uh, I have another one that I'd written down on the uh, EDF. It says it's available to facilitate business expansion and relocation to Texas. Is that business expansion? Is that that includes? I'm assuming uh, also helping businesses already existing businesses in Texas. Is that correct or no? So, so we're talking about the Texas Enterprise Fund, the the, the slides, the uh, oh, 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 the Economic Development Finance Group. So it's a division, uh, and the division has several programs, and those programs are available to communities, are available to businesses, uh, both recruitment and existing Texas businesses. Yes. Okay, bottom line, the funds are there to to yeah. get all these good businesses, a good conservative business from California. <laughs> and also for our good businesses already here in Texas. Yes, that's correct. Okay. One more question, I think. The, uh, you had mentioned from the governor's office trying to keep the state open with, uh, uh, I wrote down regulatory issues we have. I don't know if you said issues. It's regulatory something. Yeah, and so, so, um, so uh, say that yeah. again. Ask that question again. My question is, what regulatory I wrote down issues or departments, something, rules. Uh, you said regulatory something. I was curious, what's regulatory that would keep the governor from opening up the state? Oh, okay. So um, so some of the things that uh, other states were doing was they weren't letting their businesses open. They weren't letting them uh, open up. And our office or the governor was able to provide a 25% um, uh, opening, a 50% opening. And what these other companies were noticing was the state wasn't staying closed. They noticed that the governor was um, addressing any issues and then like regulations that maybe were uh, needing to be modified. Uh, they were modified to help facilitate commerce or help facilitate um, activity kind of like with the alcohol trucks uh, by, by regulation they're not allowed to carry food but the governor uh, you know 
modified that uh, in an emergency standpoint to let them carry groceries um, because uh, of the pandemic. Um, just in general, uh, we do have a regulatory environment that is uh, more conducive to businesses uh, than maybe like California or New York. Um, TCEQ, Texas uh, Commission on Environmental Quality, tends to, uh, I mean, environmental issues tend to be something that uh, some of these companies don't like. Uh, and then the maybe a heavy handed approach from government, state government, they don't, they don't like. So they like the, um, the way that Texas business environment is, the way it's governed, and that's why they considered the state of Texas. Any, any, uh, you probably can't answer this or just thought, I don't want to put you in a bind either, so don't feel like you have to. We don't do that with our group. But, uh, you know, Florida opened up 100% last week, I believe. Uh, Governor got any comments on that? Yeah, I don't. Again, he's he, he's uh, he's he's working with his uh, doctors. He's working with his uh, uh, individuals that are the subject matter experts on his uh, strike force to ensure that uh, that he's got the information that he needs to open up the the state um, as 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 they review it. And I don't. I I haven't heard anything from the governor regarding Florida's opening at a hundred percent. Um, so I, I don't think I can comment specifically okay. on that. Is, is there a list of like the doctors he has? Uh, is there a yeah, list? So there is a list of who is on his um, strike force on the website at the governor's website. Okay. Um, and you can, you can identify them. I do believe that uh, uh, John Zerwas is one of the folks mm -hmm. on the task force. That's great. Judge I, Rizal, I, I've got a quick question if I may. Uh, Larry, uh, thank, many thanks to you and to Be Betty for, for joining us today. Uh, uh, it's uh, really helpful to get the context that you've shared with us and particularly some of the information around manufacturing and advanced manufacturing. Um, I just want to point out that just uh, a day or two ago, uh, Congressman Michael McCall issued his uh, China Task Force uh, report. Uh, and in that report, uh, are a number of key findings and recommendations, including making a reshoring for domestic manufacturing a, a, a significant priority, particularly for things like PPE, pharmaceuticals, uh, and certain advanced technologies, particularly from a national security perspective. Uh, when thinking about that uh, effort, uh, as well as USMCA and some of the uh, uh, elements of the uh, trade agreement between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico that came into effect on July 1st. It would seem that there is a lot of, uh, uh, it's a, there, there's an opportunity here, here in Texas, but particularly for us here in the Houston area, uh, to, to leverage some of these activities. And so um, anything that comes to your mind that, you know, as a group from the uh, Gulf Coast e uh, Economic Development District that we should be keeping in mind in terms of the way we can work with you and uh, and and leverage uh, this this time frame, this opportunity. Yeah. So um, we we work with um, all our community economic development partners and our regional groups um, on their activities. And you know, economic development is I like to say it's a decentralized approach towards economic development here in the state of Texas, where it's driven. Um, uh, at the local level. And so uh, I think you have a lot of development uh, individuals that are part of this um, board and part of your activities. And what we do see is we do see regional approaches that are successful, uh, tend to be successful because they're not only assisting um, one part of the region, but they're assisting the whole region. And where we find that, where we find good regional groups, we find a lot of success. And, you know, the, the Houston area has a really good partnership with, with its uh, uh, economic development partners, you know, the Greater Houston Partnership, the utility companies um, are all uh, part of that. And even the group here is um, you're all very pro-business oriented and, and you have a lot of experience in, in those areas. And um, the, the communities that and the regional groups that have strategic plans that are in place to 
to identify the industries and um, you know, you're identifying your assets, which you go after, they tend to be the ones that will be most successful. So we're more than happy to work with, with your group, with your region uh, and help facilitate um, discussion and information um, with you. Um, and, you know, as part of our initiatives, our, you know, we haven't set up what our marketing plan will be for the next year or so. So any ideas or whatever you all wind up uh, putting together, if you put a strategic plan, it would be great for us to know. Um, and what we tend to do is we'll kind of evaluate what's going on across the state. And then we'll work with those regional groups or those community partners, especially if, if, if there's a particular industry or sector that needs to be targeted, we'll, we'll try to, to address that. Um, in the past, we've gone to trade shows, we've gone to, uh, we've done missions to, uh, to um, you know, domestically and internationally uh, to go meet with businesses in certain uh, industries. So we're more than happy to, to work with um, our community partners and our regional partners uh, as you develop your strategies. Okay. I appreciate it. So regional is critical. Uh, regional is always uh, is, is always very beneficial in in what we've seen, yeah. It it, it allows for leveraging, um, you know, okay. leveraging assets and resources. Good question, Danny. Other questions, comments? If not, thank you very much, Larry. Appreciate you coming. Sure. And uh, it's a lot of good information. You bet. And, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me if you, uh, if you have any questions. Um, my contact information, I, I didn't put my contact information up. I'll put it in the chat here so that you all can have it. But uh, you can go on our website. We do actually have uh, a listing of all our staff members and our phone numbers. And then uh, you can uh, uh, put a little web contact information if you need to contact me. But I'll put my email here in the chat. Good, good. And Jillian, we have we have uh, Larry's slides, correct? We do. Okay. All right. Let's go to item number nine. If that's the next one, it may be ten on the. Regular. That's all right. Let me uh, let me share my screen here, and I've got just uh, one more slide on a couple of announcements. Okay. Um, Larry, would you mind? Are are you still shared? It's not letting me share. Oh, here we go. Never mind. I got it. Just a, a couple of comments on the next schedule, and I heard from um, Isaac Perez on a couple of announcements with the LDC, but as far as next year, we want to get the dates secured on y'all's calendars, but uh, basically after this meeting starting next week, I'm going to be convening with the HGAC board and all the different committee um, administrators to work out both the time slots that we can get for virtual and in-person meetings for 2021, but that's essentially going to be in line with previous years, which usually follows for January. Uh, we meet typically the last Friday of, of January. Um, and again, I'm just being non-committal with asking y'all to put it on your calendars. Just be aware this is what's coming. Uh, April and July are usually the uh, second Fridays and October can be the first or second Friday of the uh, corresponding month. So those will be in your inbox in the coming weeks. Please go ahead and get those added. It's not clear to me yet from HGAC leadership when we're going to resume in-person meetings. Um, one of our indicators or metrics will be when uh, Harris County lowers the safety threat level back down to orange, but I'm not sure that that will be the, the ultimate trigger for returning to in-person meetings. I know we're all looking forward to that and as am I and uh, getting to finally meet with y'all and, and shake your hands formally. Um, and then I'll hand it back over to Isaac really quickly to make his announcements from the LDC. Great, thank you, Jillian. And excellent, you pulled up the flyer, awesome. And so I believe she'll make this flyer available to you all, but just very quickly want to announce this new COVID-19 program that we're that we're launching in a couple of weeks. We received CARES Act funding thanks to our revolving loan fund. And so we're able to implement this COVID-19 uh, directed program. 
it's available to the 13 county region. And so we want to notify you so you can share it throughout your networks and your businesses in your, in your respective uh, uh, counties. Um, if there's more information on the flyer, but we will have a webinar that we are co-hosting with the SBA that's uh, stated to uh, be held on October 14th at 11 a.m. So definitely do register for that if you want more information and as well as let the businesses in your area know. Excellent. Thank you, Isaac. And there will be more information on that um, added to our economic recovery resources in our digest. And I wanted to hand it over to Sarah really quickly just to get a quick plug on, on what's going on with those and the resources that they can find there. Yes, thanks, Jillian. Um, so we, we have an economic recovery resources email newsletter that comes out every Monday. Um, and those include announcements of open funding opportunities, um, resources to help small businesses, any pertinent upcoming events related to economic recovery. Um, and we've been getting, uh, been tracking the response on that. We have high open rates and click rates above industry standards. So um, you should already be signed up for that if you have our monthly economic development digest. But if uh, for any reason you're not, or if you'd like to share that with someone else, you can visit um, gcedd.org and then click helping with economic recovery. And you'll be able to see this. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, All Sarah. Right. Back to you, Judge. Okay. Our next meeting is in January 2021. Seems like a long ways off, but it's really not. Uh, what date do we have for that, Julian? Should be the final Friday of the month. I, I would just want to make sure once our schedule gets set that I say the right time slot, but um, <laughs> just, just be on the lookout. That should be by the end of next week. I'll at least know what's going on with January. Um, it, it's looking like the 25th. I just want to make sure that all the meetings are going to be in their usual time slots before I firm that up with everyone, but it looks like January 25th. Okay. 25th or 6th? Uh, I just pulled it up. Sorry. 25th. Okay. Got it. Got Thank it. You. Okay. I think that's all we have to cover. Are there any other, uh, announcements to be made? Questions? I'd like to, uh, Welcome and well, congratulate first Vince again for taking on the uh, the uh, treasurer position, and also welcome and congratulate our newest board member Josh Owens from Horton County. Looking forward to uh, your input, Josh. You're kind of quiet today. You know, I'm looking forward to supervising this board from the other side. It's going to be good. <laughs> well, you can't you can't stop doing that. So you we we welcome that. You keep us in line. Okay. That's and right. Jane, you're doing a great job. I think this is your first meeting. We've discussed a few things in the last few weeks and I'm uh, looking forward to, to working with you too. Thanks and so with much. that, there's nothing else and uh, we stand adjourned. Thanks everybody. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome.